Now, Dorothy's soon to celebrate her 87th birthday, and she's an expert on ageing by virtue of experience for various uh, governmental and non-governmental groups. And she's written a lot and worked in lots and lots of committees about ageing, trying to get dignity for the, for the aged. Now, she works a lot with her peers to bring awareness to everyone about the rights and needs, um, but also the, what the older people have to contribute to society. She's redefining ageing. So, Dorothy, you've got a few questions that you want to ask the audience. Well, I'm sort of interested in who our audience is at this minute, and of course in the future, but I would like to ask you how many of you know an older person, say 70 and over, well? How many of you know an older person well? Oh, well, that's a pretty healthy group. We were expecting a few less, but there's, we'd say maybe about 60% of the audience, so there's certainly room for improvement there. I, I was going to ask how many over 80s, but I don't think there's too many. So we won't ask that question. But I'm very pleased that you do know an older person well, because that's what the solidarity is about. What could we do, Dorothy, to increase the solidarity between the generations? Well, I think you need to get your, to know your favourite older person better. I think you will learn a lot for yourselves and for your, your future and for your children if you actually include the older person in your life uh, whom you already know or if you don't know one, get to know a new friend. Uh, you can find older people in prisons, in care homes, uh, <laughs> in they're, they're in every walk of society and they're probably in your next door neighbour, in your street or in your, your community club and in your pub. So get to know one person well and spend time with them. Well, older people are sometimes seen as a bit of a burden. I mean, let's be honest. So, and that's why a lot of people think, oh, I've got too much to do, I've got too many fun things to do. And we really don't want, you know, to have to be bothered. But, so what do you say that older people contribute to society? Well, they're very big business. There's lots of money made on us. <laughs> um, we spend a lot of money on care services and other services and buying things for our younger generation. Uh, we, we pay out in lots of ways, so we're big business, we're part of your economic community. We provide lots of jobs. Um, we also provide and provoke uh, wisdom and compassion in others in many cases. Uh, we're very diverse, of course, all colours, all shapes, all sizes. Um, but we're also, I think, guardians of our spiritual uh, heritage. We try very hard to uh, be, be, be humans, more so in our older age, perhaps, than we were younger. Um, we also provide a huge amount of grandparenting child care for free. So that's <laughs> an asset you may already be benefiting from. Um, and you will know that older people fry, provide an enormous amount of help for each other. There's a lot of mutual support that goes on, and some of the most important support networks between older people are each other. So keep those networks going. Um, make sure that they don't shrink too fast and too far, otherwise you'll have a stubborn older uh, person in your midst. Keep networks going. Keep your older person in the loop, as I say. Dementia or no dementia, still keep them in the loop. Great. So from your experience, what intergenerational projects are really working well out there? Well, I'm working in uh, various fields at the moment. Um, it's quite an honour to be uh, a paid worker again after 17 years of uh, volunteering. There's lots of volunteering out there by older people, contributing to research programmes, contributing their voice to uh, providers of services. But the three programmes I'd like to just briefly mention that I think are hopeful for the future have a more human touch. Um, one is the extent to which home share is providing homes, people with two large houses and wanting to have someone sharing their large house with them, a home share scheme, maybe in your area. There's also maybe a shared life scheme, which is a formal arrangement where you take an older person into your home and share the care that way, and provide a care, more personalised care, through having a person in the home. It's not a one-way street. You will benefit both sides. And none of these things are one-way streets. I learnt most of my wisdom from my mother during her last 
20 years, 10 of which were with dementia. It's a very good learning curve for all of us. And we're all going to get old, all being well. So well, we then, <laughs> yes, hopefully you, will, you may want to live to a great age. Um, but with, there's one other project which has been going on for some years in Cambridge, where I come from um, earlier, and that is called Cambridge Celebrates Age. And if we celebrate age rather than worry about the age of our, what we are, just boast about it as I do. <laughs> Great. Now, Dorothy, you've mentioned before that there's a problem with ageism and that actually old people themselves collude in that. Well, when I was younger, I sort of, um, I was sexist and I was racist. And I had to learn that they were part of my culture, which I had to overcome with new learning and new awareness. Now I recommend you to try and recognise ageism in our society. It's rife. It's there. It's holding back our services. It's holding back our inclusion of older people and benefiting from what they can help us with. So please recognise and take action on ageism. So what practical things could you suggest to us here today that actually improves the links between generations? Well, I think that uh, uh, if we could all collectively share things, share knowledge, share uh, concerns, and I'm quite sure that grandparents do a lot of sharing and caring, and that's part of our culture already, but this quite a lot of uh, disengagement of families, people moving away in different countries, but that's still very important. And so please keep in touch in practical ways on a weekly basis with your uh, loved ones who are older. If they're in care homes, make sure that you safeguard them and, and see how they're getting on. If they're in hospital, well, you've seen all the news lately about older people in hospital, be very vigilant with them there. Keep a close eye on your, your senior friends and so on, your neighbours. There's lots of practical things to do to keep them in the loop, making and helping them with their cards at Christmas or their, their social networks or their telephone calls or cutting their toenails. There's all sorts of practical things that friends do for, for them. And you may choose to do something very simple, like a, a very small beginning. No beginning is too small. Great, Dorothy. Um, now, we've looked at celebrating age and about enjoying the last lap, but what about death? How do we prepare for a good death? Well, I believe that we should talk about death. It, well, it's a taboo subject with older people and others, but I think, as in my younger days, we didn't talk about childbirth, but I think we need to talk about death because it would help us prepare for death and make for a better death. Um, we, we can't influence entirely when we die, but there's lots of things we can do. We can know what our options are. We can seek the place as well as the uh, environment, uh, the people we want with us. There's lots of writing about all of these subjects. There's a huge literature on death and dying, which, to which I contributed seven or eight years ago. And it, it's possible to actually think about how you want to die because it's not a good journey for everyone. And I've compared good and bad deaths in my own experience. And this is about compassion, skill, understanding, knowledge. And many of our professionals haven't got those, that training and we're still very bizarre ourselves. I mean, how many of you have experienced a personal death? Now, Dorothy, you've told me about um, an incident recently where you were invited to a friend who was complaining that she was in hospital and she wasn't being treated properly. What was that I was about? sent for by a friend whom I've known for 50 years. We brought up our children at the same time and formed the same um, efforts together to improve lives then. And she sent for me at the very last stage of her life. She was dying of cancer. Nothing more could be done to help her. But she was in a hospital where there were absolutely no preparation or pr plans for dying people and she'd been moved for f to four wards in a local hospital from one ward to another there was no peace for her and she threw her drips and drops and her, her dying state pleaded with me to uh, persuade them to let her die peacefully that was outrageous in my view that she hadn't got the environment in which to die with with peace and rest, with loved ones around her. A good death can be achieved. We've got the examples in hospices and elsewhere. 
And we have pathways in our health service which says this could happen, but it's not happening yet. Please help it to happen by talking about death. Do you think it's part of the problem that the health service just focuses so much on keeping people alive? Yes, indeed. That's the doctor's wish to keep people alive longer and longer. And we talk about um, how we want to die and when we want to die now. We're talking much more about you know, when we would like to die. And I think that's a topic uh, in the last lap that you are entitled to talk about. Thank you. Um, some people talk about living wills or advanced directives. Yes, there are steps you can take in order to let your families know once you talk about it with them. Uh, they will be able to write advanced care planning documents we have, which we can get. They can have, we can in, perform lasting powers of attorney, which give others the right with our wishes, but we must actually be asked our opinions on this. Do get to know what your older friends and relatives want. Choose, to let them choose the subjects, let them choose the ways, because we're very diverse in our religious beliefs, our faiths, our, our um, wishes. And you, if you don't get to know them, you're going to be in trouble when it gets to the event. Uh -huh. Thank you, because it's really important to talk about that and talk about if they believe in an afterlife or a spiritual life, if that has been important to them. Now, Dorothy, you're a great role model for the rest of us. We saw a picture of you as a pin-up girl there in a swimming costume playing with dolphins. So I hope I can be doing that when I'm your age, happily. What would you say is the secret of a healthy and active older age? Uh, it's a tough one, that question. I, I think I've been fortunate in so many ways um, but I, I think you need to accept living with disabilities. Uh, they're very common in older age. We've, got, we've extended lives. We haven't finished working out how to stop all the disadvantages of, of the aging process yet. But we need to exercise. We need to lead a, clean, a sensible life with a diet. I do a exercise in a gym every day. Um, and we need to do the things that we know help us. In, in this direction, uh, but most important of all is being included, being included with my family, my friends, in activities, and being taken uh, that I have a point of view that can be expressed and will be listened to. Great, Dorothy. So basically, aging's not for sissies, eh? <laughs> Old age is not for sissies. Definitely but not. I think that, that it's it's a positive approach which many of you already have. You're here today in a sparkling new way of learning and this is for me a great learning curve just coming here. Well Dorothy thank you very much for your wisdom and as you've mentioned in times gone past the importance of compassion both for older people and for older people towards the younger generation. So ladies and gentlemen please join me in thanking Dorothy. Excellent. Fantastic.